Postcards from Beyond, written and narrated by Paul Harris. The Building Blocks of Experience. The purpose of Vipassana meditation is to clearly comprehend the difference between the way things appear to be, as solid, separate and enduring, and the deeper reality wherein the things of the world are understood to be empty, transitory and illusory. To see life as it really is first requires us to abandon our emotional dependency on the things of the world. While we are still in the thrall of our attachments, we will continue to have a vested interest in willfully ignoring and misperceiving reality. Letting go of attachments can only be achieved by training ourselves to observe closely the moment-by-moment flow of conscious experience. In this way, we can correct the hallucinations of perception that cause us to mistake what is actually there with what is presumed to be there. It's a sign of how deeply mired the average person is in hallucination that when being exposed to these ideas for the first time, most find it all rather baffling. After all, it's obvious that there is a world full of separate things, isn't it? I mean, just look around you. What follows is an explanation of how it is that your perception of life really does deceive you. It cannot be stressed enough, however, that while explanations are useful, in the end, it's only through experiencing these things directly that true understanding comes. The first thing we need to consider is that Buddhism offers two distinct but interconnecting ways of interpreting life, those of conventional reality and ultimate reality. For each level, there is a description of what elements exist within it and how those elements relate to one another. Rather like Newtonian physics and quantum physics, there are unique laws that govern each level that do not pertain to the other. In other words, you cannot describe one level of reality using the rules and language intended for the other. Conventional reality, as the name suggests, is the description of life with which we are already familiar. It is the world of discrete, separate objects, of you and me, of trees and flowers, of places and events, of days, weeks, months and years, and of stars, planets and moons. The Buddha's teaching offers a comprehensive set of guidelines on how to get the most from living in this world. It teaches us the basic laws of conventional life, such as how our actions have results and how life goes on in an endless succession of rebirths. Ultimate reality is different. Here, the description is of the fundamental building blocks that go to make up subjective experience and the laws that govern how, in an endless stream, they come into being and pass away again due to conditions. Herein, we do not find a you, or me, or flower, or yesterday. For instance, in ultimate terms, there is no one who sees. There is, however, the sensitive matter of the physical eye that reacts to light waves falling upon it and which is the base upon which seeing consciousness arises as a consequence. Again, there is no thinker, but there most definitely is mind, which is the base upon which thoughts, feelings, perceptions and other mental activities arise. During Vipassana meditation, the whole of subjective experience is intuitively broken down into its constituent parts and the behaviour of those parts 
and their relationship to one another is investigated. The way in which these impersonal building blocks of mind and matter arise and pass away, link, combine and weave together to create the appearance of a world of solid, enduring objects is comprehended. It's this insight wisdom that destroys the hallucination of perception that gives rise to all possible emotional attachment to the world. Finally, in the absence of any emotional dependency upon any thing whatsoever, there is then nothing to prevent the full comprehension of that which lies beyond this endless weaving together of experience. To help us define an otherwise amorphous mass, the Buddha divided ultimate reality into five distinct groups called khanda or aggregates. These are materiality, feeling, perception, mental formations and consciousness. They represent all aspects of mind and matter, both internally and externally. It's out of these five aggregates that the illusory worldly things with which we identify and form emotional attachments are woven and nothing we experience could possibly be found outside of these groups. The Vipassana technique is to be mindful of our actual moment-to-moment -moment experience and to note the arising of any of these five aggregates. By way of an example, and to underscore the point that this process is not restricted to sitting meditation, let's pay close attention to what is happening at the ultimate level when we engage in the simple act of smelling a rose and resolve some of those elements at play down into the five khanda. 1. The aggregate of materiality consists of all ultimately existing physical phenomena. In the experience of smelling a rose, things that could be noted would include the shape and colour of the visible object and the eye base being the sensitive matter that senses the object. There is also the smell of the object and the nose base being the sensitive matter that registers the smell. There is, lastly, the pressure, temperature or motion in the sense of touch and the body base being the sensitive matter that senses them. 2. The aggregate of feeling consists of that aspect of mind which experiences the flavour of the object, which can be noted as being pleasant, unpleasant or neutral. In the instance of smelling the rose's fragrance, the feeling of pleasure is noted. Upon catching one's finger on a thorn, an unpleasant feeling is noted. 3. The aggregate of perception consists of that aspect of mind which applies a label to an object. If upon visual contact with the object, recognition of plant, rose, climber, or Dundee Rambler arises in the mind, then the label of perception is applied. 4. The aggregate of mental formations is wide-ranging and consists of all aspects of mind other than feeling, perception and consciousness. For instance, some of the mental formations involved in the experience of smelling the rose would be attention, one-pointedness, contact, pleasurable interest, desire to do, intention, volition, and investigation, to name but a few. 5. The aggregate of consciousness consists of that aspect of mind which knows the object. 
if it is a visual object, then seeing or eye consciousness is noted. If it is a smell, then smelling or nose consciousness is noted, and so on. We could continue, but that gives us the general picture. By observing and noting in this way, we find that within the experience of smelling a rose, there is a complex array of different mental and material factors at work. Each does an individual task in creating the overall event, but there is nothing concrete and solid that in and of itself constitutes a rose or me who smells. In every experience looked at in this way, we find that the underlying pattern is the same. There's nothing static or enduring in any of it, and nothing stands alone. Every individual element is found to be utterly fleeting and is entirely dependent upon other equally transient elements for its momentary existence. From continued observation, we eventually reach a point where we see directly for ourselves how it is that the apparent reality of smelling a rose is actually a complex weaving together of the building blocks of ultimate experience. And, when you get right down to it, the whole experience is empty of any intrinsic reality. It is a conceptual interpretation of reality rather than what is actually experienced. To crave and cling to any experience in the belief that it will bring genuine happiness requires the continued misperception of life as enduring, satisfactory and ultimately controllable. And this means continuing to ignore the deeper reality. Consciously turning the mind to look at the building blocks of any experience and repeatedly noting the transient, ungraspable and conditioned nature of whatever arises naturally begins to undermine those misperceptions and, therefore, craving and clinging attachment. So what difference does the direct comprehension of the ultimate nature of reality make? Life carries on in much the same way as it always has, but is now free of any emotional dependency upon any part of it. Just as you know when you sit down to watch a soap opera on television that none of it is really real, and yet you are still able to partake in the story and even empathise with the plight of the characters. So, in the same way, you realise what a wonderful cosmic soap opera life really is. It is indeed empty of any intrinsic reality, and yet there is something there, and what is there is endlessly new, fascinating, wonderful and mysterious. Through the generation of insight wisdom, you teased life apart, then put it back together again, and now you know what is real and what is merely conceptual. As the Buddha declared, I use the terms, but I'm not confused by them. Only once you have fully comprehended how the world is magically woven together moment by moment from these fleeting building blocks of experience, only then do you realise what perfection really is and truly understand what it means to be free.